Hello, welcome back to Learn Economia. In this video, we are going to discuss the concept of endogenous growth theory and the different models which come under the arena of uh, endogenous growth theory would be discussed uh, here and the criticism faced by endogenous growth theory would be discussed and also the policy implications of different different endogenous growth theories would be discussed here. Before starting what endogenous growth theory is all about or the different models of endogenous growth theory, we have to understand that endogenous growth theory involves a collection of theories given by different different uh, development economists. So actually these collection of theories would constitute endogenous growth theories and that these theories uh, are formulated as a reaction to the omissions and deficiencies which are found in the swallows van neoclassical growth model. When you look into the swallows van neoclassical growth model, we could see that it is something which is based on exogenous factors. And uh, when you look into the case of the neoclassic, uh, when you look into the case of the endogenous growth theory, which is also known as a new growth theory, uh, this is something which would explain the long run growth rate of an economy on the basis of endogenous factors. But in the case of uh, the uh, new classical growth theories uh, all the uh, all the factors which are related to the long term economic growth are exogenous coming to the swallows and new classical growth model we can see that the growth model in this growth model the long run growth rate of an of output uh, is based on basically two exogenous factors or two exogenous variables and these are the rate of population growth and the rate of technological progress and this is for them is independent of the savings rate in the economy as the long run growth uh, in the solar swan growth model is dependent upon exogenous growth exogenous factors this had a few policy implications only Romer, one of the economists who had given a lot of contributions to the arena of endogenous growth model, uh, for him uh, in the models with exogenous technical change and exogenous population growth, it never really mattered what government did. If you look into the case of a macroeconomist uh, like uh, Adam Smith, uh, Ricardo Marx, etc., these people who are known as classical economists, they also give, they had not given importance to the role of the government. When they say uh, government doesn't matter, they mean that whenever there is a problem in the economy, all would be cleared by what is known as market forces. So the demand and supply would clear all the problems, all the problems will be solved by the market forces in the economy. So as a result, there, there is no uh, role of government required. The same idea is borrowed here with respect to the uh, exogenous um, um, growth theories. They also say that it doesn't matter the role of what the government did. The new growth theory or the endogenous growth the model does not simply criticize the neoclassical growth theory, but uh, they have tried to attempt uh, to understand the, um, uh, the loopholes in the um, a new classical growth model and they came forward with some solutions to the uh, uh, new loopholes they faced with respect to the neoclassical growth model. So what the endogenous growth theorists have done is that and they have extended the uh, con their contribution by introducing certain endogenous technical progress in their growth models. The endogenous growth models are mainly the contributions of different in, um, e different development economists like Arrow, Romer, Lucas and there are several other economists who have contributed a lot to what is known as endogenous growth models. We would be discussing each of these models in detail in the upcoming video. So what I have been planning to do with respect to this particular session uh, of video is that I'll be giving you a glimpse of what endogenous growth theory is all about. But in the upcoming videos, we'll be discussing each of these theories in detail the theory of Arrow in detail, the theory of Romer in detail, the theory of Lucas in detail, and several such theories in detail. So uh, let's understand uh, the 
crux of what endogenous growth model is. So as I have already told you, endogenous growth model says that uh, the long term economic growth rate of an economy is something which is determined by certain endogenous factors and what are these endogenous factors the endogenous growth model have em given emphasis uh, to technical progress which results from the rate of investment the size of capital stock the stock of human capital etc so these are certain endogenous factors which are given importance to by the endogenous growth theorists these are the rate of investment the rate of uh, the size of capital stock stock of human capital etc now, having said so, what are the criticisms which are basically faced by the endogenous growth theory? We have seen that this particular theory or the new growth theory or the endogenous growth theory came as a reaction to the omissions and deficiencies of uh, the neoclassical growth model or the solar zone growth model. But that doesn't mean that endogenous growth theory is free from criticisms. These two this particular sets of theories to face a lot of criticisms from different different angles so what are these angles and what are the criticisms faced by different endogenous growth theory or what well, uh, endogenous growth theory in uh, a collection or a, a, as a common entity what are the uh, uh, criticism faced by endogenous growth theory we can see that different economists have pointed different different problems to endogenous growth theory. As per Scott, the main ideas of the endogenous growth theory could be traced back to Adam Smith. And also it could be traced back to the increasing returns to Marxian analysis. As per Srinivasan, he doesn't find anything new with respect to the endogenous growth theory because he says that increasing returns and endogeneity of variables have been taken from neoclassical models as well as Calder's models. Now, Fisher also criticizes uh, endogenous growth theory. He says that the endogenous growth theory uh, depends only on the production function and steady state of economy. As per Oslan, uh, he says that the new growth theory or the endogenous growth theory gives too much a focus on the role of human capital. As a result, it neglects the role of uh, what is known as institutions. So, um, in different models of uh, the endogenous growth theory, the difference between physical capital and human capital is not made clear. And as a result, there have been many problems. Uh, for example, in Rama's model, uh, capital goods are very much important for economic growth. He says that human capital would be accumulated and when it is embodied in physical capital, it would become it would become a driving force but he doesn't make a clarity uh, which is the driving force whether human capital is the driving force or physical capital is a driving force so that kind of distinction is not made clear uh, with respect to Rama's model so this um, uh, non-clarity or why this person is not made uh, clarity with respect to the distinction between physical capital and human capital so this aspect has been criticized by various economists also we could see that by using secondary school enrollment as a proxy for human capital in the model manqui romer uh, will find physical and human capital combination can only lead to perpetual economic growth so this manqui is also a person who had contributed a lot to what is known as endogenous growth theory so um, uh, we, we would actually discuss uh, the different contributions made by different economists to endogenous growth theory. We will be discussing each of these contributions in detail in the upcoming videos. Coming uh, to the policy implications of endogenous growth theory, uh, by starting today's session, I have already told you that uh, the exogenous growth model or uh, the neoclassical growth model or the model put forward by Solus Van. So this, these uh, model, uh, this particular model actually had a few policy implications, especially this is because it already rests on what is known as exogenous factors for determining the long term economic growth. But as against in the case of exogenous growth model, endogenous growth theories have got a lot of uh, policy implications. And this uh, is not only for developed economies, but also for developing economies. So for both developed and developing economies, these particular uh, uh, set of theories, the exogenous, uh, sorry, the endogenous growth theories have got certain policy implications. Both developed and developing economies have its implications. 
So uh, coming to the first implication, you can see that this particular theory uh, or the new growth theory or the endogenous growth theory suggests that convergence of growth rate per capita of developing and developed economies can no longer be expected to occur. So when I say convergence, uh, uh, what I mean is that the mo movement of uh, the pattern of per capita income line so whether it would be meeting whether the, whether the per capita income um, line of uh, developed economy or un, uh, and uh, developed economy and developing economy would be meeting so for the people for the uh, endogenous growth theories this kind of convergence uh, would uh, this can no longer be expected to happen and the increasing returns to both physical and human capital uh, means that the rate of return to investment would not fall in developed countries compared to what is happening in the developing economies. And also they say that um, the rate of return of capital in developed economies is very much probable to be higher than what is happening in the case of developing economies. As a result, capital need not flow from developed economies to developing economies and actually the reverse would be happening and these, uh, this is something which we could see uh, with respect to um, endogenous growth theory. This is something visible and uh, empirical evidence to support us. Another implication involves uh, the measured contribution of both physical as well as human capital to growth and this is something which is considered to be larger than the suggested uh, growth uh, by the solo residual model. If you look into the case of investment on in education or investment on in research or investment on in development, we can see that this these things have got only uh, or this have not only positive effect on firm itself, but also it has got some spillover effect. This has got some externalities on other firms, and as a result, this would affect the economy as a whole. And what it it suggests is that uh, the residual attributed to technical change in the solo growth accounting may be actually quite smaller. So that is the second point. Coming to the next aspect, we can see that um, it is not that necessary for economies having increasing returns to scale uh, to reach a steady state of economic growth. Uh, so um, as what is this is something which is suggested by solar sand model, but we can see that when there are large positive externalities from a new investment happening as a result of research and development, it doesn't uh, it doesn't mean that it would it would uh, about it is not necessarily actually for diminishing returns to start. Um, uh, there there can be uh, positive externalities as well as negative externalities externalities but when there are large positive externalities from new investment uh, it is not necessary for the returns to start so growth rate of income it doesn't slow down and uh, the economy doesn't reach a steady state but an increase in saving rate could make permanent increase in growth rate in the economy also, we can see that countries having greater stocks of human capital and investing more in research, development, etc. would be enjoying a faster rate of economic growth. And this may be one of the reasons for a slow growth rate in certain developing nations. So uh, I think uh, I could give you some idea with respect to the different endogenous growth models. And also, actually, we have not gone into the details of different endogenous growth models in this particular video. What I intended is to do is that my plan was to give you a glimpse of what endogenous growth theory is all about. Uh, what are the different theories uh, which comes under endogenous growth models and what the endogenous growth model in a collection. What are the criticism faced by these uh, this particular sets of theories and also what are the policy implications of these theories. So I think I have done my job. So my job is done. Now, um, uh, please like, share and subscribe to this channel for more videos. And also please be a part of my Telegram channel and Telegram group to discuss your doubts. So we can meet uh, with a new topic uh, in the new section. Till then, uh, I, am very, I, am, I am actually requesting you to like, share and subscribe to my channel. That's all for today. Thank you for watching.